today, um, we have a study session on consolidated dispatch number six participation with the police department. Chief Myers, would you like to begin? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Council Chair. Thank you, Council People. Thank you, citizens, for being here. Um, before I get started on the presentation, I want to acknowledge that Captain Andrew Zelazny from the Dearborn Police Department, representing the Dearborn Police Department and the Dearborn uh, United Dispatch Center is with us, as well as Jordan, as well as Jordan Selleck, who is the Executive Director of the Conference of Western Wayne. Okay, who, I just uh, unmuted will... both of them. Um, Andrew, can you put a picture up? So <clears throat> Uh, yes, give me one second. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Chief. I'm sorry. Okay, and then you know, Jordan Selleck from the Conference of Western Wayne. She's the executive director. She has a, a very good knowledge base about the state level politics that are involved with uh, public safety access points, um, costs of running them, and the, the, uh, the mood and the feel of the Michigan legislature on the need for consolidated dispatch throughout Michigan. So they're here uh, to kind of support the uh, presentation, but also if there's any questions on levels of from people have about Dearborn when we're done or from the Conference of Western Wing. So they're here with me as well. Um, with that said, I'm gonna try to get a PowerPoint going if there's nothing else from you, Councilman, Council Chair, if that's okay with you. All right. Okay, let me know if you can see it pop up on your screen. Yep. All right, perfect. All right, you should be seeing it now right from the beginning. So uh, once again, thank you for allowing me to do this. Um, this session is about the Dearborn Heights uh, dispatch staffing and operations discussion and why I'm presenting it to City Council that it is my recommendation that we participate in the Dearborn United Dispatch Center. Um, this came up uh, approximately four to five years ago when the idea of a consolidated dispatch was just that an idea. Uh, Dearborn Heights participated in that request for a uh, proposal on how to create one and participate with one. Ultimately, over that time, there was too many uncertainties and the council at that point chose not to participate. Um, five years have gone by since that start date. The dispatch center is now up and running since 2018. Many of those questions are now have been answered and it is both my duty, both operationally and fiscally to present a problem that we're having here at Dearborn Heights, both operationally and fiscally, and a solution that will be both beneficial to the citizens, the residents, the police officers, and, uh, and uh, the members of our community to provide dispatching services. So with that being said, I'm gonna go into the uh, presentation. And uh, first, I would just like to reiterate what the mission of the Dearborn Heights Police Department is, really highlighting at the end, the part that uh, are in the middle that says, to accomplish our mission, the members of this department will work in cooperation with the community and other law enforcement agencies in a manner which reflect the highest degree of integrity and professionalism. It is my belief doing the research that we've done over the last three years that by joining this dispatch, we will be at that point of pro uh, professionalism, both for our communities, keep providing excellent service, but also working in a consolidated atmosphere, being fiscally responsible and creating the safest atmosphere we can for all participants. Um, just to give you a historical idea of why we're at where we're at, the City of Dearborn Heights budgets 13 members for dispatch. At any given time since 2013, the maximum number of employees we've been able to retain has been 11. The lowest in 2017 was almost half of what we were budgeted for. 2018, you see nine. That's actually not an accurate number because until November, we ran with of 2018, we still ran with seven dispatchers. That was the first time we got back up to nine. Um, I think it's, it's good now to tell you what a dispatch center does and what it looks like. Every shift has or should have three members. One to answer emergency and non-emergency lines coming in 911 and nine emergency lines. Someone to dispatch those over the radio to the police officers, 
and then a third dispatcher that does lean, which is the law enforcement network, as well as fire rescue. So they're dispatching the fire uh, trucks and the ambulances at any given time. That is three people answering on average 40,000 phone calls and dispatching just over 30,000 calls for ser emergency service. Um, so that would be three per shift. We run four shifts, so you need a minimum of 12 people to do that. We have not had that number since 2013, since before 2013. Um, I'm sorry? Okay. Uh, so those three people, that's the minimum standards that we run with here is the three, is what we would like to see. Um, we actually had 14. Optimally, what you would want to see is 16 dispatchers. So when one person was off, we would still have our three dispatchers. Um, we have no supervisor dispatchers. So a police supervisor is the direct supervisor of our police dispatch, taking them away from uh, supervising the patrol officers on the road they're actually supervising the dispatch center. So why is that important? The staffing level is important. Um, getting to just the stats, these are the raw numbers compiled about our calls for service. In 2019, that number of times we've dispatched with three people in that dispatch center was only 13% of the 730 shifts in 2019. Um, preferred number would be four, uh, so you had a supervisor or a, a replacement so somebody could take a break. Only 13 times, did, or 13% of the time, did we have that number of dispatchers. 63% we had two dispatchers, and on 24% of the dispatchers, one out of every four approximately, uh, we had one dispatcher in that room along with a police officer trained um, dispatcher. So what does that mean? If you see up in the top right corner, 18.8 percent .8 of the time we actually took police officers off the road from patrol so we could safely operate our police dispatch center we paid 4383 hours of overtime to try to staff that in 2019 that's with police officers dispatchers whoever we could get um sadly that was better than 2018. 2018 we never ran a single day with three dispatchers in dispatch. 68% of the time we ran with two and 32% of the time we ran with one. And 15.5% 15, 15 of the time we had a full officer off the road. I think Mr. Wenzel has a question. Oh, no, I'm just, I just wanted to get in line for questions when you're done, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, so we paid just under 7,000 hours of overtime at that point. So going back to that original slide, 13 is what we're budgeted for. 14 would be great, but we haven't reached that now in close to a decade. Um, and we are not alone. The uh, Jordan Selleck from the Conference of Western Wayne will confirm that this is a statewide problem for dispatching, that they're short everywhere. Uh, we've had open hiring cycles, but now we're, we're running, we would either run our dispatchers into the ground, which we can't do because it's not safe. And it's starting to affect what I think is the professional service that Dearborn Heights uh, deserves. So I'm gonna go back the other way and get you back to where we need to be. But I think more people many times are concerned with dollars and cents. So the dollars and cents, uh, is what makes this physically um, responsible and uh, a must for us to do. Um, taking the 2020, 2021 budget, this is the, the total numbers and I'll get down into the deep dive of the numbers in a minute, but for to, to employ those 13 dispatchers that were budgeted for, which we don't have, is what just north of $1.1 million. The facilities to operate and upgrade about 107,000 and at minimum, the technology of 346,000 for a cost of $1.5 million. Um, instead of coming to you with just a problem, I chose to come to you with a solution. And that is the Dearborn United Dispatch. Um, I uh, obtained costing for our first year for the uh, Dearborn United Dispatch. This is an all-in price. 
of $886,000 for our dispatching service to be part of the Dearborn United Dispatch. That is a first year savings of just shy of $700,000. Um, that is year one of a, of a contract. Um, yeah, and that has, and you'll see that there were some big fees in that and we'll, I'll show you that. Um, this is the breakdown of wages for 13 employees. Wages, uh, social security, their pension contributions, holiday pay, longevity pay, um, other pensionable benefits and healthcare. That's how I came up with that $1.117 uh, $1 million. Uh, this is how much it would cost just to fix our facilities that are now 17 years old from the day we opened the door. From the day of the build, they're approximately 19. The flooring, uh, the windows, those things, the workstation, they are all going on 19 years old at this point. Uh, from The building was opened in 2003, construction started in 2001. Uh, these are some of the costs we would incur just to operate this year to make it a safe functioning facility. The technology, these are our knowing costs. Our Viper upgrade is the largest one you'll see. That's a $250,000 cost. We are notified by Entrado, the system that does our 911 servicing calls, that as of last year, that they would no longer service our system. It was put in in 2014. Uh, they put us on notice last year that in 2020, well, before the end of 2020, it had to be replaced, um, that they would no longer service it. We did one extension of a year. Uh, we, ba we basically paid 30 some thousand dollars for a patch, but they will no longer assist us. So that has to be replaced. We have an annual contract for that as well for service and maintenance for 24 by seven. Um, the equature taping and the backup radio systems are gonna be approximately $346,000. So that's where that number came from. And then uh, I think that's all of them. And this is looking out for a recap of the numbers that I just showed you again, 1.57 versus 886 with a savings of uh, just shy of $700,000 in the first year. Going out to a second year, um, and Dearborn could explain this probably a little bit better at the time, but the contract would show it. They take, they use the consumer price index. They come up with our percentage of calls and they come up with a fee. You can see their fee did go up a little bit and our costs went down for the second year. So you'd only see on average, roughly $300,000 in savings for every year afterwards. That's with knowing costs, any technology costs, anything that the state throws at us as a mandatory, mandatory technology upgrade, anything like that would just contribute to a greater expense for us when our flat rate dollar for Dearborn would be $904,000. That is a flat budgetable rate that we would know every year. Um, obviously, they, we would get that in a three, I believe it's a three or four year contract. Captain Jelazny would probably be able to expound on that a little bit more. It is recalculated, they do take into numbers, but it is, it's uh, static and it is budgetable. Unlike where we're at now, where we don't know what breaks, what has to be replaced. So again, a great savings. Uh, get to it. So just to finish up, I know that's a lot that I'm throwing at you, but uh, the why now? Um, the Dearborn United Dispatch Center runs with a dedicated police supervisor or lieutenant that runs the entire center. The center is now two years old. They have supervisors that actually manage the dispatch floor and they are responsible for the management and the supervision of their dispatchers. That's something that we haven't had, nor is it contracted or budgeted for us to have, even if we were at full staff. We're looking at nearly a $1 million savings in the first year, in the first two years alone. And we have fixed costing that's part of the contract. So it's known and budgetable. Um, and then consolidated dispatch services uh, shows an increased availability of uh, funds through grants because that's what the state is going towards as Ms. Selleck would probably be able to explain better in a minute. Um, it's encouraged at the state and the federal level, Western Wayne County or Western, this area of Wayne County, the Tri-County area is the only place that really has this many public safety access points. Most do it on a combined uh, premise throughout the state. Um, it eliminates geographic isolation. Right now, we are on an island where we sit on our radios, on our dispatch centers. We have Dearborn, Inkster, Garden City, Westland, um, and Wayne, 
all on the same chant, all on the same dispatch and Dearborn Heights sitting in the middle of all of those um, by ourselves. So when something happens, when we need to know what's going on a bordering street, we actually have to communicate via uh, outside line rather than monitoring right within our own dispatch center. Uh, so that, that causes um, confusion and many times the consolidation of dispatch speeds up that process. And then finally, uh, our dispatch center, um, their Dear Dearborn United Dispatch Center is reaching its capacity and the Dearborn Heights Dispatch Center, um, which every member of council was invited to come see, many did. And they also were invited to see Dearborn Center. Our dispatch center is almost 20 years old. Um, we have to do a complete upgrade, which would best be an entirely new cost that I showed you some of it, but this is a good move for Dearborn Heights. Um, I, do, I do understand that I have great employees that work here, but I am running them into the ground. I am not able to provide the service that I think Dearborn Heights deserves. And I believe the consolidated dispatch service at the Dearborn United Dispatch is the best option for the Dearborn Heights residents and for the police and fire. This is supported by Chief Brogan and the Dearborn Heights Fire Department. They are on board and I, if we unmute him, I'm sure he'll have some comments as well. So that, that's it for right now. I know there's a lot of questions, but I'm gonna stop sharing that presentation if, unless you want me to leave it up. Okay, no, it's, it's fine, take it down. Our first question comes from Councilman Wenzel. Well, first of all, those numbers are very disturbing, terrible. Um, I have a couple questions. How's, how is our pay compared to the other cities uh, dispatch pay? And I'd like to see a performance uh, uh, rating of the staffing for this Dearborn. Are they 100% every day? And uh, also, is there any chance of getting our current employees, if we switch over, our current employees employed with this, this new uh, dispatch center? If, uh, uh, Captain Zelazny, would those be good questions that you could maybe address about on the Dearborn end? What about the pay, the, the pay part? Is our, is our pay a lot, lot cheaper than they pay, Dearborn pays for dispatchers? If, if you're asking if they're gonna be better compensated at an hourly rate at Dearborn, I believe the answer is yes. Okay, all right. And this, for, a top, can we, for, a top, for a top pay dispatcher, I should, let me clarify that. For a, a dispatcher at top pay, they make more per hour. That is my understanding. If I don't have the number in front of me, that's not something I've discussed. Okay, well, you, it looks like you did a lot of research. Do you know if they have 100% staffing 100% of the time? Captain Zelazny? Yes, uh, so first of all, thank you all for having me here today. Uh, my name is Andy Zelazny. Um, I'm a captain of the administrative division in Dearborn, which oversees the United St uh, Dearborn United Dispatch Center. So welcome to uh, Council Chair, Mayor, and uh, uh, Police Chief. So uh, first off, our full-time staffing in the city of Dearborn for this dispatch center is 37 currently. We're currently at 35. Um, we're trying to get to our top staffing, but with retirements, uh, some health turnover and some other issues that is just normal with uh, these type of positions, that's where we're at right now. So that is our, our goal is 37. We do carry um, some part-time dispatchers that's separate to this, this staffing that doesn't affect the manpower. Um, and um, our goal is to get to that 37. You know, ultimately with the question about uh, uh, job positions, um, that's one of those items where I can't speak in specifics because of some regulations uh, with civil service and, and human, human relations. But what I will tell you is that in that area, it's gonna be treated exactly like it was with the, with the Westland consolidation um, it's, um, I believe we had a separate, it's a separate list from our usual hiring list. It was consistent more like an internal posting. So it was streamlined. So there wasn't a, um, uh, some of the, uh, the, the same steps, but it did, it did, um, get, uh, check the marks with our human resources department. I will say that anybody with the Westland consolidation that wanted employment with the city of Dearborn, I believe there was 10 or 11 of them they all were given positions with the city of Dearborn um, Consolidated Dispatch Center. With this uh, move, if we do bring, De if Dearborn Heights does decide to come on board, we're looking at uh, adding a, uh, 10 dispatchers. So that would be from 37 to 47. Uh, so with our current level of 35 to get up to 47, 
there will be ample opportunity for for uh, um, all the uh, Dearborn Heights dispatchers that would uh, be seeking that opportunity. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Councilman Carson. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Chief Myers, and maybe Andrew. Uh, so, what communities now are part of the Dearborn area dispatch, and do you see uh, further economies of scale if Dearborn Heights comes in, uh, for example, and possibly some other communities? I, I, I can't speak for Dearborn United. I, I, I know that they're saving a seat at the table for us. I can't tell you if there's any other communities coming in. And what communities are now? It's Westland, uh, uh, Melvindale, uh, Inkster, and um, is it Garden City? Yes. Yeah, so this uh, this project, the the actual looking into this project, I think goes back to probably 2012 or 2013. So Chief Fidel has been working on this for quite a long time, along with our uh, Mayor John O'Reilly Jr. And uh, so the original design was for seven communities. So it started with, and I know Dearborn Heights was one of the first ones that uh, initially had interest, and we had some meetings back then, which I was not a part of. But the first to join was the city of Melvindale. So we went the first year with Dearborn and Melvindale. And then last July 1st, we brought aboard everybody who was part of the Westland Dispatch Center, which was Westland, Wayne, Garden City, and Inkster. So we're up to six. And as I said, this initial de design of this consolidation was for seven. So um, hypothetically, could it, could it go larger than seven? I would say yes. I'm not really prepared to, to, to speak on that. I think that's more uh, in, in Chief of Ed's wheelhouse. It could technically go higher than seven. I don't see much more than seven, but this thing was initially designed for seven and we're at six. But could you speak a little bit to the economies of scale? You know, that the cost of this equipment is expensive and it's it's spread out. Uh, yeah, what I will say is uh, the, one of the biggest factors with this and uh, at the beginning of this, uh, you know, I, the state of Michigan, and I think Jordan could probably speak on this really is uh, their position is is for consolidation and so in, in 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 dispatching, and I know uh, around the state of Michigan, I think it's more common. I think around here, um, it's it work it's kind of coming down to us, but that's that is where the state of Michigan wants people to be for shared resources, shared intelligence, and overall, um, um, you know, better public service for everybody, and that's what we think this this consolidated dispatch shows. Um, at the beginning of this, there was a, a, a grant, and I don't remember the, the number off the top of my head. It's, I believe it was a between three and $5 million grant that went towards the technology to start this dispatch center. So as of two years ago, as Chief Meyer said, our dispatch center opened, and the, at that time, the equipment was state of the art. And the, the, the key with these situations is to have the great equipment and the, and the, and the, and the whole, the bottom line with it is you got to stay on top. You got to continue to improve it, and that's the commitment that we, uh, the chief has made and the mayor has made. So we do still have uh, uh, some amount of the initial uh, uh, project grant that goes towards the equipment. We have uh, see continuing grant money from the state of Michigan. There was another grant that um, uh, was awarded for this year for continuing. A, upgrades to the equipment. So that's one thing we are making a commitment to. The equipment's the best and our our goal is to stay with it. Um, Doug Felkamp, who I believe does your uh, IT as well, is the yes. resident expert on all of our equipment. So I think specific questions about that sort of thing, he could probably answer better than I could. But we have made that commitment towards keeping up on being the best with that. And that's that's what's gonna keep this thing going and keeping this thing successful. Um, and are, are people clearing uh, the background check and so forth, the dispatchers, the experienced dispatchers from Dearborn Heights should be able to fold into the Dearborn United dispatch? A absolutely. And um, um, the, you know, the, the nice thing about the scenario for Dearborn Heights right now is we, we have a perfect test situation a 12 month test situation with the city of Westlands consolidated dispatch. And with anything, there's gonna be, you know, anytime there's change, there's always some some challenges, but 
we have done a nice job and we do want to keep things consistent, but in the dispatching world, things are pretty consistent already across the board with equipment and protocols. And uh, it's been, you know, it's, 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 uh, oh. Gale, who does our day to day operations, who is a police officer, does oversee our dispatch center, has done a great job communicating with each entity, fire, po fire chiefs, police chiefs, and we make sure we have everybody on the same page and uh, uh, to provide the best service we can, which is the bottom line here is it's in enhanced public service for all the all the stakeholders here. Thank you. Next, we have Thank you. Yeah, um, a couple of questions here, or a couple of comments, actually. Uh, when this first came up five years ago, um, I was adamant that our people that that uh, were the dispatchers get a job. Okay. And as they go through the process, it looks like they'll be losing some seniority and go to the bottom of the totem pole, which I don't particularly care about. And, um, uh, and I know five years ago, uh, we had all the liability and nothing to say about how the place was being run. So how do we, you know, join a group and what say do we, you know, city council have and how it's, how it's maintained and run? I mean, um, we're going to be paying a lot of money, and uh, we want to have, at least I'd like to have some say in how, the, how it operates, because uh, I'm sure the Dearborn City Council is going to have something to say also about the way it, it operates. And thirdly, why did Westland stop doing their um, uh, group activity with their, with their group of people? And lastly, Melvindale is obviously getting theirs for free. So who's paying for them? Is that part of our fixed cost also? And if it is, why should we end up paying for someone that's not paying? Anybody can answer those questions. I, I can do a couple of them. Uh, one is, yes, they would be different employees. They're no longer employees as, of the city of Dearborn Heights. If they go to the city of Dearborn, what they negotiate or what's there is going to be between them and Dearborn. That is your, you are accurate there, Councilman Muscat. Um, as for the Westland, what did they do with theirs or why? Um, without going into the exact numbers, they're leaving or they closed down their dispatch for the exact same reasons I just presented to you. That it's financially the best thing to provide the greatest service to the citizens of their community, as well as those other ones. That is that is a paraphrase from Westland. I spoke to the deputy chief at Westland today, and he said by far the best move they've made as a police agency to provide better service to their citizens, period. And I encourage every council person to contact Garden City, Inkster, whatever, and speak to their fire chiefs or their uh, police chiefs and ask them, because I believe you'll find that they are very pleased with the service. Um, and I think Fire Chief Brogan might be able to speak not on behalf of all the fire commands, but on an overall feel from fire. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I could tell you that, that cause one of my concerns was losing all of our uh, voice, if you will, like when we have our own dispatchers, Dearborn Heights dispatchers, then we have a lot of say in what's going on. And so a uh, concern I had was if we go to Dearborn, are we gonna lose that, that uh, voice that we have now? And so in speaking with uh, all the fire chiefs in the area that, that are, um, that are involved in this, that they, they assured me, and they said that they went up, they've gone above and beyond making sure that they felt um, listened to and they took everything that they said seriously and they made the changes that they wanted to see made and, and, and they gave a lot of reassurances that it was working out very well for them. Yeah, you know, I, I care about our dispatchers, you know, getting jobs and, and continuing their seniority. I don't like seeing someone lose, you know, 10, 12 years seniority or whatever they have. It, it, it's very hard for someone to start back over again. And, and, and I'm deeply concerned for their welfare. And uh, again, uh, I'd like someone to speak about the liabilities and how much say we have in the future as we go along and how that place is operating. Yes, sir. I, I can speak on a few of those issues. Uh, first, uh, you touched on the Mel Melvindale. So yes, Melvindale was actually, this will be the second year they've been on and their uh, membership in this consolidated center was in coordination with the Melvindale Fire Service. So that it, it's, it's, that's what brought that about. Um, what I will say is 
none of the unfunded liability or any of the costs that existed in the city of Dearborn prior to the broader consolidation last year with the, with the addition of Westland and the other three cities were, were passed on to any of these joining, any of the joining communities, including Dearborn Heights. So the formula that, and I was not the one that did the formula, there was somebody much smarter than me in finance. That formula was the same exact rationale as, is, is the same thing that was given to the floor from the consolidation last year. No, none of the Dearborn liability or responsibilities prior to this consolidation was passed on in that formula. So, and I, so this thing was not made in any ways to be a money maker for the city of Dearborn or to pass off any of the un liabilities from other cities. This thing is strictly about shared resources, uh, communication uh, enhancement and, and really enhanced public safety. Um, as for the liability, um, it was presented to me and Captain probably will be able to go further with it. But as the liability, they are the liability owner of the dispatch center. Um, we're the liability owner of how our police react. Right now we're the liability holder of how our police and dispatch act. Is that correct, Captain Zelazny? That that is correct. But what I what I will say though, and one thing we've done, a, a, and I'll give all the credit to the Chief at Ed and Lieutenant Langell over this last year, we brought in four communities with, with two public safety entities apiece. So for all intents and purposes, eight different departments. And um, everybody does have uh, uh, want to say in these things. And he, uh, Captain Langell particularly, sat down at, at, at every request to, to work on things particular for each city. And I think if you would ask the, the chiefs of these cities, both police and fire at this point, they're pretty happy with the bottom line in, in what they have now. And um, so, you know, we will do everything we can do to make everyone happy in this, in this endeavor. I, I, I guess what I, I really wanted to say about liabilities, if the city, it, it make, if the dispatching unit makes a mistake, costs someone their lives, and they get sued, all that liability is going to be passed on to everyone, right? So this was brought up in, in depth in the, in the um, study sessions last year before the consolidated dispatch with, with Westland. And what I will say is we do, kept re, we do, we do pay for a separate insurance rider, rider for this that comes out of the Dearborn police budget. Um, as far as dispatch liability on a broad spectrum, I, to my knowledge, and I, again, I, I, I don't want to play what ifs, and I know this, this was discussed at length. You know, yes, there's always liability, but in dispatching, and th there's very, there, there's, there's not a lot of precedent, or, or uh, there's not a, a volume of precedence in dispatch liability um, that we that was brought to our attention or through through the research. Is I, it a, is it is it a possibility? Absolutely. But we do kept, we do carry that separate insurance for that reason. Um, but I don't want to get off on a tangent of legalities because I'm not an attorney. So, See, my, my, my concerns are, are, are the citizens of the city having to pay for something with really no say on how things are operating. That's my big concern. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, yeah, I guess, uh, Captain Zelazny, you answered uh, some of the questions I was going to ask, actually. Thank you. But a couple questions. Uh, I know you touched a little bit about... Uh, I guess, you know, the oversight, you know, with the technology and, you know, that changes, you know, uh, per periodically. At, uh, and my question is, obviously, you know, when you mentioned that, you know, the current administration is up for uh, upgrades, you know, if anything is obsolete, you know, that you guys will upgrade it. But with a, a newer administration, you know, that, that stuff could change. So I guess my concern would be, is for us, you know, if we proceed with this, you know, what kind of like, is there like an oversight for the, the cities that are participating in this for the council or, you know, the mayor be involved in any decision or just periodically visit the facility or, you know, I guess have like a report card, you know, some of the upgrades that you guys are doing so it doesn't slip with the newer administration. Yes, yes, sir. So that's, that's a good question. So, you know, with, with, um, I can tell you, first off, 
I've got five years left of my career, and I will be in command of this dispatch center probably in some shape or form. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I, you know, you know, I, this is my mission. This is my charge to, to make sure this dispatch facility is best for all the, the, the shareholders. So it's, it's in my best interest that this continues. So yes, I understand uh, with, with uh, political terms and uh, our, you know, you know, in a year and a half there, you know, there, there will be elections for mayor and city council. So that, that is an issue, but it's still the overall mission of this thing is to continue, you know, to serve all our entities in the future. So I guess if you were to join this, I, you know, we want everybody to be a stakeholder in this. You're paying for a service, so we want to make you happy, but it's also in the city of Dearborn's best interest to make sure this thing's state of the art. So, you know, that's, that's where we're coming from with this. Uh, with the contract setup of the Dearborn Dispatch Center, so we, if you were, so the way this thing is set up, you would actually, if you were to join now between July 1st, 2020 and June 30th of 2021, that which is our fiscal year, that would be year two of the four year setup. So you would be joining in year two. So that would be this, this fiscal year and two additional fiscal years, then it would reopen. And at that point, I think some of those, um, I guess, if those are major concerns are brought up at that point, it's actually pretty good timing to address those. Thank you. Uh, second question, I don't know who can answer this question, but I know this is gonna be a concern for residents is uh, response time. Has anybody done a study what the response time is now, you know, with our current dispatch or what would it be, you know, if we switch over? Because I know this is a big concern that I've, I was asked that question numerous times. So I, I guess I can answer that in two parts. One, response time, there, there's goals and then there's reality. So it, response times are based on call volume and things like that. So I can't really give you a benchmark on call volume. Now to go on the other side of that, a dispatch center doesn't create an extra layer of, of slowness. There's not like a call to a call to a call. The same calls that were coming to Dearborn Heights into our Entrado 911 uh, Dispatch Council through the phone lines will now be routed to the Dearborn United Dispatch. So as quick as they went into our dispatch, we'll go into their dispatch and then be dispatched from a call taker into the CAD and out to the road. Those times don't change. There's not another relay. So the actual process of dispatching of a 911 call come in will either increase because there's more call takers because we have one call taker, one dispatcher, one uh, lean operator. When dear one, if uh, Captain Zelazny could correct me, at times they may have more than one call taker inside of Dearborn's dispatch. So the phone line ringing may actually be a shorter amount of time before it's picked up. As for call volume, I can't, I can't determine. There have been times when we don't have a run for four or five hours. And then there's times when we have 25 runs in one hour and we don't run that many cars to even be able to accommodate those. So that that's fire department does it by the second, police department does it by call volume. That's the only way we can really measure it. Thank you. If, if I could add one thing to that uh, after the chief there, I don't have any direct numbers in front of me. What I will say is, you know, if anything, our, our Dearborn numbers have been consistent. It has not changed. And I don't have the numbers of these other departments. What I will say, I believe with the enhanced technology and the system and the, and the affiliation of these other departments, the service, the quickness in, in very dangerous and high priority situations is where you really see a huge enhancement. And, you know, we had the situation with the city of Melvindale when they first joined they had a shooting situation that ended up spilling over into our Oakwood hospital without getting into too many details because of the consolidated dispatch that were life safe that night because this thing, this thing was um, as critical as they come. And that's about as far as I can go into that without the dispatch of a community directly next to us being in house there. If a phone call is transferred from one dispatch center for like Melvindale to a Dearborn, 
that we're, the police officers are always behind, whether it's 20 seconds or a minute, they're always playing catch up because we're boring and we were on the same uh, uh, line and the same uh, dispatch center, that thing was handled. Our officers were on it the minute they left Melvindale and the thing was handled, you know, as good as it could have been handled. So I guess I don't have a response on the call times, but I, I have, and there's been examples throughout the year. Uh, Friday, if I, if I can. Oh. Yeah, if I can ahead, Captain, uh, I believe it was Saturday night on Telegraph Road was a prime example um, of a rolling shootout that started in Dearborn and ended up in Dearborn Heights. And this type of scenario is the perfect example of why Dearborn United Dispatch is a great option. Because there, that communication, although we do our best to do it between two agencies, would become more in sync with one another, um, just like Captain Zelazny said. But our, our event this weekend would be, is another prime example of, of that flawlessness that can come out of it. Thank you. We have Councilwoman Hicks Clayton last. Yeah. Oh, I'm your iPhone can hit it too. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. You can hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I think most of my questions were answered. That's what happens when you go last. Um, I do appreciate the cost analysis. I think that's important, but I also want to remind everybody that's a very big decision because once we lose our dispatch, you're most likely not getting it back. Okay, the cost of re, um, you know, you dismantle it redoing it is not feasible, by the way, cost-wise. Um, I did have a few questions for follow-up, though. One was the liability question, which is always a concern. I know Councilman Muscat had already mentioned that. Um, I'm very concerned where the liability falls. And I know I think you answered that question. Regarding your dispatchers, um, I, too, want to see our dispatchers get hired. I really don't want to see them lose any of their years of service. I'm uh, sure that maybe can be something that could be negotiated out through contractual. You had mentioned there is 35 dispatchers right now in Dearborn. You would add an additional 10 if Dearborn Heights is brought on. My question is, what is your turnover rate with the existing dispatchers you have right now? And what do you attribute that to? That's the first question. So at the beginning of the year, we had uh, more dispatchers than normal, the Dearborn dispatchers that retired um, for multiple reasons. So we started off the entire year trying to catch up to our number. So we went from 22 dispatchers, 22 to 24. I don't remember the exact number when it was just Dearborn and, uh, and then we, Dearborn and Melbourne, then we went up to 37. So we quickly had to close the gap, you know, 13 or so dispatchers. So frankly, over an entire year, you know, with the challenge of hiring qualified dispatchers, which is, um, uh, I think, a universal um, a concern for all entities, it's, it's, it's a challenge to get there. Uh, we, I would say over the year um, of, on top of the people who retired, I think four to five people in the year, uh, I, I could be off on my numbers uh, slightly, you know, Jack could probably speak very more specific on that. But four or five people left throughout the beginning of the training process uh, due to a multitude of reasons that I, you know, for, I guess, HR and other reasons, I can't really get into details at this point. Um, our goal is that we, you know, we hire and test uh, consistently to try to get to, to make sure we have people in the pipeline to fill these positions. Um, so really the, the, the thing that really, you know, when you sit back and look at it, you have uh, a company come in uh, to do a, a, a professional uh, analysis of how to get to where we got to get. And we, you know, we just didn't come up with these decisions, you know, at the uh, spur of the moment or, or without thought, but um, you know, getting increasing if you have if you have 37 people to jump from 22 to 37 that's a quite a quite a lot of people for that small of an entity it's it's you know you know you're looking at almost 20 percent increase so to get there to get through training and to get to where we want to be you know that's 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 challenging which is another reason why if Dearborn Heights has qualified and, and wanting dispatchers that want to come aboard 
I would be the first person that would spot. So I guess, you know, that's, that's where we're coming from, you know, but that's just, you know, they're, they're, that's not the way of, of, of the hiring process, but it's just, it, it, it is a challenge to keep up on the consistency. What I will tell you is of the people who are there, we don't have uh, any um, planned retirements on, on the horizon, which is good news. We, you know, as, as cities do at times, you get a, a rash of retirements, whether it's police, fire. We just went through such a, a um, period in our, in our city, and we're at the point where as far as planned retirements, we're not, you know, Good. seeing any in the next several years. Okay. Um, and I, I can't predict other things that occur, but you know, that's where we're at. Okay. My, my concern is the, um, I'm sorry, the, the overtime that may be incurred that leads to burnout, right? Because we already know how tough that job is. I mean, it's very, let's be honest about the job and what it's like. The, the last thing I have, though, Madam Chair, is just real quick. When we talk about stakeholders or shareholders, it's really important to make sure, like, one, we're at the Dearborn City Council on this. Two, engaging our citizens as well as the dispatchers that we have, bringing them all to the table, which we, I don't think, I don't see that happening. And I think, you know, we have this meeting now, which is public. It was posted, but I don't think it was, like, promoted as a town hall. We're very capable of doing that with technology to do like a Zoom town hall meeting. These are going on all the time every week. I think it's really important that we hear from all of those um, stakeholders, you know, our citizens, um, our dispatchers, as well as Dearborn, we need to hear. You know, we appreciate you being here. Thank you, but that's my thoughts on that before we move forward and make it. Okay, we have council one, so is this a quick one? Or has it been answered? Yeah, I, I, I'm just wondering when, uh, when a Dearborn Heights resident would make call in would, it, would would the phone be answered Dearborn dispatch and confuse them and if uh, and are they turned over to a specialist in Dearborn Heights or a, a, a person that has to know four communities so when the when the dispatchers answer the phone they answer it's Dearborn United Dispatch Center yeah it's a, the minute the phone is answered by the as the chief said we have a call taker and the call taker is backed up by the lean operator and and there's usually the fire volume isn't as high as police volume in, 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 you know, relative to each city. So at times, if it goes down to where a third call person would come in, one of the fire uh, dispatchers would be on backup or whatever available person is there. But it, I think some of the council people were there at the center. So you call, you would call 911 from uh, your phone. It would identify where that call is coming from and it would automatically go to the appropriate um, uh, dispatcher. So whoever's working Dearborn Heights police dispatch that day would take the call. And then any additional items that would come in over the telephone would be inputted by the call taker. That information would simultaneously and instantaneously go to the dispatcher so they could be updated in real time as they're dispatching the runs out. I think in an emergency situation, people are panicking. It'd be a good idea to just say emergency dispatch instead of saying Dearborn. Someone might hang up the phone, try to try again. You know, I mean, I got the wrong number. You know, I, I'm, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm not exactly 100% sure if you call 911 because, and that's, I will, I will look into that specifically for you and get you an answer on that. They may say 911 emergency. I'm not okay. sure. I, in, I should know this. I'm in command, but I've never called 911 on the other hand either. So. I'm sorry. If I can just add to Mr. Wenzel real quick. The, it, we don't. I know we speak sometimes in a language that not everybody's familiar with. When I talk about CAD, it's actually computer-aided dispatch for dispatchers. So you do not need to be familiar with the city to know where they're calling from, what the closest cars are, where the cell tower is that it's coming off of. All that's provided instantaneously through that call. That's to take human error out and to add that layer of being able to dispatch efficiently, knowing uh, in the fire chief, I won't go too deep, but they know exactly what units to send based on the type of fire instantaneously and it tells the dispatcher that. It's not something they have to learn. It, it's, it's a process that, and it's a, it makes for a better, more efficient process. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Um, I, I have one last quick question. Will Melvindale ever be charged for the 911 service, or do you think it's a lifetime fee? I'm not exactly sure on that, but I can look into you and get you a response. Of, of I, I'm not even sure what their um, 
their uh, commitment and their their contract is. That was well before I was involved in in this uh, endeavor. But I, I can get you the information or oh. whatever I can get to you. I can I just add to um, for Melvindale, you're looking at about two thousand calls annually. So in terms of call volume, compared comparatively to everyone else, if that's something that you're worried about, of how much um, how much resources it's taking from Dearborn, their calls are very very minimal. I mean, two thousand calls is not much at all. <laughs> yeah. All right. This concludes um, the study session on the consolidated dispatch. Next item on our study session is grass cutting bids. I need Director McIntyre and you need Director Selmy too, I do believe, right? Is that right, Director? Director McIntyre, can you hear I'm, me? I'm here. Okay. Do we need Director Selmy on muted too? Probably, yeah. I got him. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Hi. <sighs> All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so this is uh, John Selmy from Public Works. This is regarding the DPW bid. Um, I don't know, I don't think Director McIntyre put anything on the agenda for it. So there was a couple questions regarding the bid for the DPW uh, portion of this. This is, I just wanna make sure everybody understands this is two separate bids, one for city owned property and then one for ordinance. So this one that we're speaking of is the DPW one specifically. So there was some questions. One was regarding the uh, workers comp requirement for uh, the contractors. So on the 25th, I believe I sent the council an email, um, page 14 of the bid document that requires all contractors to have workers comp and also additionally hold uh, the city uh, harmless. So I just wanted to, to point that out because that seemed to be uh, a, a, a point of uh, interest. Uh, secondly, uh, what had to do with the bid price. Um, so again, two separate projects, the, the DPW bid project. Um, I sent you also in that email, the, the spreadsheet and highlighted uh, uh, in red was the DPW bid and yellow is the uh, ordinance bid. So for the DPW bid, um, the current contractor was the lowest bidder at $4,000 per cut. So I just, those are the points of clarification that I took away from that meeting. And I would be happy to try to answer any other questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody have questions? I have Councilman Muscat, go ahead, please. Yeah, is I don't know if I'm looking at this incorrectly, but uh, I look at artistic bid, and at the end it's forty-eight thousand dollars, and uh, the other one is uh, Eager Beaver at thirty-three thousand and eight dollars. They're, they're they're two separate two separate bids, right? So the column in yellow is for the ordinance cuts. The column in the red is for the DPW cuts. You know, I, I don't, and I, I apologize because I don't think I have that. All I have is the bids that were opened and what they said. I didn't see anything else. And I'm looking at them right now, and yeah, I don't I have it. that. Yeah, I sent it on Thursday, June 25th. So, uh, you um, know, I, I, see, I, I see the certificate of liab liability insurances and, and references. And there should be a, there should be a uh, Excel spreadsheet attached to it also. And that is what is missing from my packet, unfortunately, because I kept looking at this and couldn't understand why one was so, you know, 13,000 or $14,000, almost $15,000 difference. Right. And that's why I was trying to highlight in that Excel spreadsheet to, to separate the two out, because if you initially look at it that way, Yes, it is different. The Eager Beaver bid, I think he's about, uh, off the top of my head, like $1,500 more uh, per cut city properties. Yeah, I don't have, the, unfortunately, I don't have that spreadsheet. I so can I'm kind of a, at, at a disadvantage here looking at this um, amount of money here. And um, 
So I'm going to have to uh, sit back and let everybody else ask questions, see if I can uh, decipher it on my own here. Thank you very much, Mr. Salmi. I, I can forward it to you right now if you'd like. If you don't mind, please. Any further questions or concerns? I don't see anybody use oh. uh, Dave Abdallah. Okay, Councilman, in the future, use the little hand. It's easier to find it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. I, on the last meeting, I did it four times, to be honest with you. Four oh, different okay. times, and I didn't get called. So, and I did it on this one also. Okay. You were using the, the applause button. The, it's under it's reactions. Under, Sorry. Well, you have the hand up. That's what I did. Okay, got it. Anyways, um, the question I had is for uh, uh, Director Selmy and Director McIntyre, as far as the two companies are concerned, when it comes to, now, in this particular case, we're only dealing with the city-owned lots. So with the city-owned lots, it was not, it was, it was 100, to be specific, it was $126, so it's a mm -hmm. minimal difference. And I got, uh, without divulging specific names, but and I don't know how public they wanted it to be, but I got an email from someone um, with pictures in regards to one of the companies and the pictures were honestly not very comfortable for me to look at as far as the type of job that was done and, and specifically not a good job. Um, so with whatever you can share publicly for both directors, which one have you had, what type of experiences have you had with both companies? I know you've had artistic for a while, but we want to make sure that we put this out for bids and make sure that we get the best price possible for the residents. Right. So I can just speak for myself. I mean, Obviously, I've only been here for a little bit over a year. Artistic was in place when I was hired. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I have not had any complaints about city-owned properties. Uh, they cut everything along the B-Course Creek, the incinerator, a lot of properties uh, that border a lot of homes. And I, honestly, I have not received one phone call. The, the other contractors, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know anything about them, so I don't have any history with them. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I can, I can tell you. Um, Prior to Artistic doing the city cuts that John Selmy is responsible for, there wasn't another uh, contractor that was doing it. That was a decision that Bill Zimmer made because he was falling behind uh, with the city cuts because of um, so many other obligations in the DPW department that, and if you remember, that became a conversation at some of the council meetings. So he opted to go with a contractor to just do the city cuts. And, and as John said, he hasn't had any complaints. <clears throat> I, I know we're, we're already past seven o'clock and it was making me nervous that I wasn't going to get time to talk about this, but I wanted to talk about what happened, if you don't mind. Sure. When, I came, when I came into the department, uh, things in terms of the grass were slightly chaotic. Um, it was being managed through the building department at one time, and each person in the building department kind of had a different hand on it. When, that, when I came in, we kind of took the grass over uh, in the ordinance department where it should be. Michelle, who I think is on tonight, um, uh, became the sole person to do everything related to grass, and it made it much more efficient. Um, but I will, but I will tell you, when I first came in, uh, we would get a lot of invoices. Well, we'd get, we had a lot of complaints um, about um, grass not being cut on the day that it was supposed to be scheduled to be cut. We operate five days a week, uh, and in order to do that. Uh, to, for it to make sense for a business, that business needs to be a local business where they can go the night before each scheduled cut, drive around with their staff and see what they're gonna be cutting the next day to make it efficient for them. Since I've had um, artistic, I've never had a single complaint, uh, not one single residential complaint. And keep in mind, my cuts, uh, the city gets reimbursed for. Uh, we pay the contractor and then we bill the, the resident. And on top of billing the resident, uh, there's also administrative fee that goes with that. Uh, so there's no gain for that. I mean, it's just strictly about getting the grass cut for residential properties. Um, I, we had a lot of issues with uh, pictures when I first came in not being time stamped. So it was very challenging to go to the resident and say, your grass was cut on this date. And I'd show them the picture and it didn't have a timestamp or it was cut three days after it was told to them by per ordinance when it was going to be cut. We had some challenges with invoices that um, I felt were overinflated. Um, I will tell you an example I've got in my hand right now, the most recent invoice that Artistic submitted to us. There's about 90 cuts that he submitted for payment on here. And of the 90 cuts, there's only four debris Holloway charges. When I first started here, I would, be, I would say it's safe to say that almost every other property 
not only was were they were we being charged for the grass cut, and although we get reimbursed, I still have to be conscious of the fact that a resident is going to end up paying this bill. I want to be mindful of that. I want it to be done in a way where it's not gouging the resident. Uh, but at the same time, we need to get the grass cut. When I first came in here, I could I could tell you that almost every other invoice that was submitted to us had a debris Holloway charge, and I just found that very um, hard to believe. Uh, since Artistic has taken it over, it's very minimal. I mean, one or two maybe on a, on an invoice. This looks like a double. Uh, this is I've got a couple pages of different invoices, and like I said, out of ninety, there's only there's only four. Um, this I'm I'm I obviously. You know, I, I kind of was thinking about it a lot today and I thought about we all, you know, go to the same car dealer because when we go there, we get a good deal. We're, we, we know the person. We know that they're going to do right by us because we've done right by them. And that's how I feel about Artistic. They're a hometown business. They're the only business that's submitted that is a hometown business. We've literally not had one single complaint in four years about their work that they do. In fact, we have the exact opposite. We have people calling all the time complimenting the company that came out and cut the vacant property on their block. Uh, they, they trim it, they edge it, they blow the, the debris out. It doesn't end up in the street. They make sure they pick up the garbage ahead of time so that it's not being chewed up and spit out all over the place. Um, as I said, very limited uh, bulk or debris hallways. I think that's significant. Um, it speaks to their, their um, character. And, and, and on top of it, he has high standards for his staff. I get a lot of compliments about his staff. Oftentimes they'll be out cutting grass for us, doing ordinance things, and they find themselves across the street helping someone jumpstart a car or uh, you know, move a couch into a, into a truck to, to, because someone's moving and going away to college. I just got a call the other day about that. So I, I wanna go with the person, you know, I, it, it's taken me a long time to build this grass program into something that I think that we can be proud of. And a big reason why I'm proud of it is because we've had a company that's honest and has high integrity and they do a really good job for us every single day. Um, you know, that's why I'm pushing for that company. I've had experiences with a lot of companies. Um, some that I think, and I'm not speaking about anybody that's here tonight. This is, you know, even prior to the other company that's asking, but some that maybe could have even been criminally charged. You know, we had, when I first came in here, we had some companies that were charging for dumpsters and, 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 <coughs> And, and somehow that was, that was being, you know, being allowed to happen. So that's not the case anymore. It's a good program. We have a good grass program. We have someone who re is, takes it very seriously and responsible. This is a hometown guy. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we need to give him credit for that. And uh, you know, I'm asking for you to consider him as, as the contractor for our, for our ordinance cuts again, so. Okay, let's open it up for you. Uh, does council have any questions? All right, this time it concludes the grass cutting business. At this time, I will open it up to public comment, which includes both grass cutting bids and the consolidated dispatch. Does any of the residents have any comments on that? Uh, Dana Parrish, um, can you go ahead. Good evening. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, this has to do with the grass cutting. Um, I understand now, I won't uh, speak to which type of grass cutting, but I understand employees, this is by speaking to city employees. City employees are not now, nor have they in the past been offered grass cutting overtime. And if they have, I would certainly like to see the overtime rotation list. If someone in the uh, in the appropriate department could show that information to the uh, to the residents or to the council, I would appreciate it because it's my understanding that they are not, nor have they in the past, been offered the opportunity <coughs> to grass cutting in the city. And I also understand that the uh, there are contractors in the city who give, uh, who provide city employees with uh, gifts in the form of uh, food. That's also been brought to my attention. That's against city ordinance. It shouldn't be tolerated. Mm. If somebody is, if that's happening with somebody, I'd like it to be reported to 
to city council or the mayor to be addressed. Um, we can talk after. Any other questions? Any other public comment? Um, this is public comment at this time. Yep. Director McIntyre had his hand up. Are you commenting as public or are you answering um, Mr. Parent? Well, I think I should if he's insinuating that I'm, I'm accepting food in, in exchange for a contract. So to, to, just to clarify, if I could, sure. my, cut, my cuts have nothing to do with employees. Um, the city employees have never cut ordinance properties. I didn't the, say they the did. City... I didn't no, say they, they did. Oh, pardon me? I did not say they did. I, I, that was not directed to you. You are not okay. in charge of the department that decides whether or not they cut okay. your Are you? Well, I just... I just wanted to clarify that, yeah, that doesn't apply to my department. Right, exactly. And the second thing is, just for the record, I don't even take a free iced tea from Tim Hortons, and we accept no food at our counter ever. So if no, someone's okay. participating in a potluck that we used to do Christmas potlucks, sometimes people that are that have, uh, you know, might stop by for a potluck and maybe bring a dish to pass, baked beans or, you know, uh, you know, something like macaroni salad or something. But Nobody, I don't take food at my counter. We don't accept any kind of gifts, so. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point in time, I do I hear a motion to? Make a motion to uh, uh, close the study session. Support. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, at this time, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Or, no, let's, is a five minute break okay? Can everybody Five minutes. Yeah, because I gotta, Make a quick run here. <laughs> five minutes. All right, five minutes will begin at seven eighteen. <laughs> 